Hi everybody, Charles Hoskinson here. This is going to be a slightly different video from what you guys are used to. Uh, this video is a, a bit orthogonal to Cardano, but uh, I wanted to make it to talk about something that's a side passion of mine, and hopefully we can find a connection to Cardano for it. So let's do a little bit of a screen share. So recently over Twitter, you may have noticed that I'm finalizing the acquisition of a very old game uh, that I played when I was a kid. It came out in 1992, and the game is called Legends of Valar. And it was created by Synthetic Dimensions, and it was, a, uh, I think, a husband and wife team, uh, Kevin and uh, another gal, and Kate Cope uh, Stake. And uh, Kevin died in uh, 2011. Uh, but what made this game so special was that this game was really one of the first 3D open world RPGs. So basically the story was somewhat simple, uh, but it was a lot of fun for uh, somebody who was seven years old. Uh, you played a character that you create yourself. And I actually have some screenshots here. So right here is the character creation area. Uh, and you have a background and a story. Uh, and then basically you enter this city called Middle Dwarf. And... Uh, you're looking for your cousin named Sven. Uh, so uh, you're looking around the city, and how you try to find him is by going to various taverns, and they have a message note board system inside the taverns. And uh, basically on the message note board, uh, Sven gives you some instructions. And inevitably, after a little bit of the runaround, uh, Sven tells you to join a bunch of the guilds. Well, there are four types of guilds. There's a temple type. Uh, there's a magic type. A thieves guild and uh, two different types of warrior guilds the mercenary guild and the men at arms so each time you join a guild if you complete all the guild quests you eventually get a skull one for each direction and they use that with an orb of vision and a book to summon a demon and it turns out that the demon can help you free the king uh, so i played this game and uh, it was really revolutionary in that uh, the city was huge in fact it was several square miles large uh, and there were thousands of dwellings, and uh, there was an underworld component. So there was the main city level, and then there was dungeons underneath uh, the uh, the city. It had kind of a novel mapping system. For example, you can see here the uh, the green area. That was the in-game map. Uh, it was actually a full 3D world, and you can see all these beautiful little bit, bit maps there. Uh, and it, it had some cool things, like, for example, over here in the in the HUD, you can see the health bar and you can see the combat wounds and uh, other such things. And you could actually get conditions like boils, and you could smell in the game, and you could starve to death or die of insomnia. You could catch vampirism. Uh, for, for the time, there was quite a bit of thought that was put into it. There was even a trading system. There were uh, six different types of resources, uh, gems, spices, pigments, or hide and uh, tar. And you could trade these things uh, amongst the different stores in town. Uh, wealth was basically uh, allocated where if you went north in the city, uh, it would be the rich areas. And if you went south, those were the slums. So for the trading system, you'd go to the stores in the south part of the city, and then uh, you'd go and resell stuff in the north part of the city and make money. But there was all kinds of cool little trading pairs there. Uh, there were a few different types of weapons, swords, axes, uh, dagger would be thrown. And uh, then there was a crossbow that was connected to a quest in the game. Outside of that, I don't recall any other weapon types. And combat was super simplistic. And then here's a picture of the uh, underground cave. And there were actually uh, three different items to find. Uh, there was a necklace, some gauntlets of power, and then uh, some boots. Oops. Let's go back. All right. Let me click escape on the keyboard. Get out of the screenshot. There we go. Uh, so anyway, it was a favorite game of mine. Todd Howard played it. He's guy who created the Elder Scrolls, and it uh, was a big inspiration for his team as they created Arena, uh, which later evolved into the game Skyrim over many, many generations and iterations. Uh, so basically, what are we, what are we going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? So I personally acquired the game, and we're just finishing up some of the last-minute details on the... Uh, let me clear this canvas. We're just finishing up some of the last minute details on the acquisition, but it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Mostly just uh, payment information and things like that, but uh, just sign the IP acquisition contract. Uh, but the state of the game right now is that the IP is here and there's some assembled code and not much else. 
sadly. You know, and that's the problem when you buy these old DOS games. I went through a broker who buys a lot of old DOS games and games made in the 80s and 90s, early 90s. And this is very common where you'll find that the studio's out of business. It's not really clear uh, who has what, where. Uh, you know, y y you're lucky if you get a single line of source code. And in fact, uh, even in famous games, it's sometimes very difficult to get things. For the most ex uh, famous example of an enhanced edition of a game uh, was Baldur's Gate. Now, this was a triple-A title, super popular, made millions of dollars, made by a top-tier gaming studio with a top-tier publisher, uh, Black Isle with Interplay. And despite that, uh, they still had trouble getting all the source code and getting all the game assets, and they had to do a lot of work to get it to a point where they could actually add new content and modernize the game. So it's uh, quite common, especially with these older games, to start uh, at bedrock. So the first thing we're going to do is we're right now in the process of disassembling. So disassembling is where you go from compiled back to the source just to try to gain an understanding of uh, all the things that are actually in the game. Uh, the dialogue, the character names, uh, hidden quests, unfinished things. So there's a lot of secrets to uncover. So it's almost like archaeology. You know? So we're going to walk our way through these things. And that'll take a few weeks to months. And I'm doing this with a personal team uh, that I'm working with. Uh, so this is something for Charles, not IOHK. As I mentioned, orthogonal. <laughs> And uh, we're also trying to hunt down anybody who was involved in the testing development of the game. Uh, unfortunately, several of the core developers have died because uh, it was well over 25 years ago. Uh, but we will probably find somebody, and we're just going to try to figure out what the unfinished ending was supposed to be. Uh, so what happens is that after you get those four skulls and you free King, I think it's Wilf, Uh, the game just kind of says, okay, and you ask around, where is Fen, my cousin, the guy you've been looking for the entire game? And everybody replies, he left town. Every single person in the game. And you're like, okay, well, what next? And there's nothing next. And so uh, that's going to have to be redone. Uh, so after uh, we figure out uh, what we want to do, uh, basically to end it, I'm going to create an enhanced edition for the game. And the enhanced edition uh, will basically modernize the game to a point where it's playable on modern PC. And like Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition, I might find a way to make it uh, a bit more cross-platform. They even did an iPad and an Android uh, version of it. And I even played the iPad version of it on, on many plane rides across the sea. It was actually a great experience. So kudos to Beamdog for their uh, great work here. Really enjoyed that. And, you know, it'd be really nice to see if we can get this to 4K resolution. We can do redo a lot of the bitmap art and uh, make a, all of that a lot prettier. Uh, kind of like when... Um, uh, a lot of those action adventure uh, games were remade. Uh, Monkey Island, I believe, was one of them. But there's been several that have been modernized through the days. I, and then uh, the map system needs to be redone. There's a lot of problems there. You need a quest log. here in the pictures, uh, what, what exactly do these things really mean? Like, what is the difference from the health symbol from the heart symbol? And what's the difference of the lightning bolt versus the sword, right? It's never really super well explained in the, in the game. So there's a lot of really cool things that are going to have to be thought about and added in, uh, in addition to an ending. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll just keep chipping away at it, and I'll find a, 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 a nice way to end it and a nice way to modernize it and really bring it into the, uh, the 21st century and make the game playable. So that's kind of the first step uh, after going from here. So I'm going to go from 
this rough basket of nightmares. We're doing some archaeology, code archaeology with disassembling. Uh, and eventually we'll get to a point where we understand enough about it that we can know all the secrets. And then we'll either write something completely new or figure out what they wanted to do. Uh, and then the enhanced edition is basically about bringing it to the masses. Uh, and then uh, I'll release that. And then what I'm going to do is rewrite and remaster the entire game. Remake. As a AAA. And I'm going to probably do this in Africa. So I will train up a whole group of game developers, uh, probably in Central Africa. And we'll have a lot of fun writing the game in Clojure. It's a cool language I've always wanted to do a project in using something called Arcadia. And Arcadia is a framework to use Unity 3D with Clojure. How about that? Alternatively, I have been looking at a peer script plus Babylon JS. That might actually be uh, a more viable option. So that'll be a decision I make in the years to come. Now, how this is relevant to Cardano is that I'm really keen to see if we could create a game distribution, kind of like Steam, rights management, and in-game items using a, a blockchain backend. So basically, here's a, a straw man example. You have your blockchain, and then you basically issue non-fungible assets, and those can be items. Then when you buy a game, you get a DID that you register with it. And a DID is a decentralized identifier. So we could use PRISM for a system like this. And then you can do your digital rights management based on that. You own a copy and that DID's there. And then you can actually purchase special assets, items, other things as a microtransaction and then those can be connected to your profile and used in an imported into the game. It would be really cool to see if we can create something like that because this actually can work in both ways. You also could create a game marketplace where people could create their own things and they could sell those things uh, in the marketplace. So just by you playing the game, if you get tired of it, maybe you have a lot of really cool things, you can transfer ownership from one did to another did. So it'd be super cool to see if we could explore a system like this and build something into the game itself. Uh, and we could create a whole economic layer to the game that is seldom there. So why Africa? Well, Rwanda in particular is a very attractive place because they're actually trying to build a Silicon Valley there. And so there's great subsidies, and I think the price point fits cool, uh, really nicely. Uh, and it'd be super cool to train up a bunch of people like we did in Ethiopia, get them really keen with functional programming. Uh, and people are super passionate about game development and uh, bring them there. And so this is kind of a, uh, a roadmap for where I'm going to take this project. It's kind of a side project. It's something that I'll be doing on and off over the coming years. Uh, and by no means it actually take a lot of time. It's usually, in fact, the, I've been haggling for over a year and a half about uh, this acquisition. And it was just, you send an email, you get an email, these types of things. It's the same situation here. You negotiate a scope of work uh, for disassembly and what you want for forensics and send the secretary to go talk to a few people. Uh, and then you wait a few weeks, you get some answers back, and you learn a few things, and you keep going through. So it's not really going to interfere or disrupt anything. And I'm doing this personally, not IOHK. Uh, as for the enhanced edition, I'm still deciding whether I'm going to actually charge for that or give it away for free as an open source project. It would be really cool to make it an open source project because I'd like as many people as possible to play this game. It brought a lot of joy to me when I was a kid. And 
it would be really cool to see if I can bring a lot of joy to other people. Um, it's hard these days to make an entertaining, nice game. And back then, I mean, we didn't have a lot of options in 1992 for amazing 3D engaging worlds. And so you had to use a lot of your own imagination. And sadly, children today don't really have much imagination. It's all spoon fit to them. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm going to be doing here. Uh, so I figured I'd make a video about it to kind of talk about these things. Uh, it certainly is going to be fun to do some code archaeology and it's going to be really fun to uh, to build something like a map system and a quest log and these other UI elements. Uh, we take a lot of these things for granted, you know, but actually uh, there's well over 30 years of iterative knowledge that's been gained. Um, the camera system for games, uh, where you put the camera, is it third person, is it first person? Uh, how do you adjust that camera? It, it's actually quite a difficult thing. Um, in games that get it wrong, it's incredibly frustrating because you actually can't see your character or you, you can't get an optimal view. Uh, you know, also, uh, what was really cool about Legends of Valar is that it actually had a random like dialogue system, randomized dialogue. So whenever you talked to somebody, uh, they would randomly be generated. So you just have this uh, person, and then it would automatically assign them a name and a religion and other characteristics and attributes, and also a friendliness score. And basically, based on your interaction with them, you could actually ask them, what is your name, what is your religion, and these other things in the dialogue tree. And as you went through the tree, you'd actually get all kinds of answers. Uh, and those were actually randomly selected from a finite set uh, that existed. So they had some sort of name dictionary, religion dictionary, and so forth. And they put all these things in. And that was unpredictable. So 1992, this was a, a major deal. You know, Everything was scripted back then. And suddenly, you can actually have these random events. Uh, there was actually a day-night cycle as well. That was a big innovation for that game, and I really enjoyed that. And actually, during the nighttime was the only time you'd see uh, monks, vampires, and werewolves. And you could even talk to the vampires and werewolves. You'd run into them. The, the vampires kind of looked like Ferengi. I guess they were basing the model on Nosferatu, but uh, it looked more like Quark. Uh, werewolves, uh, actually, I have a little picture of them here. Uh, yeah, here, here was the werewolf. And you literally could talk to the werewolf, and it would say, grr. They couldn't actually speak to you, but they said, grr. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Uh, so, uh, And you can see these little guys here. And this button right here uh, where you have the mouth, uh, that's how you'd hail somebody. And when they come up to you, uh, you'd actually be able to talk to them. Let's see if they have an example of the dialogue. Um no, they don't have a dialogue screenshot. Okay, that's sad. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that was really cool stuff. So it'll be a lot of fun to explore how to enhance this randomization feature. There is a Carnegie Mellon University project called Scepter. Uh, and Scepter is um, something like that. And uh, Scepter is uh, basically a, a different way of going about randomizing dialogue. Uh, and so that'll be really cool. It'll be cool to actually create a proper resting system and get a better day-night setup uh, and to really explore these things. Death in the game was permanent. So if you died, you're dead. It would say R.I.P., rest in peace with a gravestone. An example of the draconian Old Testament game rules from 1992. However, there was uh, an, an option to buy insurance and uh, true to form, insurance was only sold by monks at night. And there was one cat a quest in the uh, Temple of Set, uh, Guild Level 5, uh, where they would actually just give you some insurance. But basically, if you die, it will resurrect you. However, there was a chance that the insurance you bought was bogus. So you have no idea if it was real or not. Uh, or if it, and you just kind of roll the dice. Uh, and so I think there were three different types of insurance, and some of it didn't work. Uh, and it was variable from 20 to uh, 
I think 10 to 40 gold pieces, the insurance. This is also a system as law enforcement. Uh, one of the most frustrating and fun mechanics of the game uh, was that guards would just randomly arrest you for no particular reason. I don't know why, but they would just be like, you're under arrest for excessive snooping or you're under arrest for acting suspiciously or you know some other crime. Uh, and if you pickpocketed people, they'd arrest you for attempted robbery if you failed the pickpocket attempt. Although you could kill anybody in the city without any consequences and you'd never get arrested for it. So, you know, it's weird. You'd get arrested for random things, but committing murder in front of a guard had no problem at all. Thank you, 1992 game mechanics. Uh, so that was a really cool mechanism. And if you couldn't pay the fine, uh, you'd actually be thrown into one of several prisons, uh, the turret, the brig, uh, the gallows, and so forth. Uh, so it was a really revolutionary game because it had a fully working legal system, but not a particularly good one in that respect. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. Yeah, uh, I guess a broader point is never forget your passions. I've waited over 20 years to try to find a way to fix something that I wanted to fix. You know, it's really frustrating when you truly love something as a kid and it didn't quite end the way you wanted it to. And then you somehow, as you get a little older in life, get an opportunity to fix it. Uh, so never lose your passion and never give up on things and really do enjoy things. You know, life only comes at you once and how you live it's up to you. I, and it can't always be about hardcore coding and protocols and science and writing papers. You have to have different ways of expressing creativity. And if something as simple as a game uh, can do that. And along the way, you can blend where you've gone before. Like most people, they just set up a game studio where they live, Colorado or whatever. Why don't we go do something in Africa and see what we can do? Most people would write games in C++ or C Sharp or some language like that. Let's see what we can do with Clojure and the Arcadia project. That's really cool stuff. And because we're not crazy, you can connect it to Unity because it uses Clojure CLR. Uh, so it's a Clojure port to .NET, which runs in mono. So that's pretty cool stuff. And then along the way, you can make a lot of friends and learn a lot of things. And if you guys have some cool ideas about how we could add game mechanics which are blockchain based or do a blockchain based drm that's a bit more fair than the drms that we have today uh do give it a thought and it'd be fun when the time comes to explore that be also a really good way of testing our non-fungible asset standard on cardano uh, so this won't happen for quite some time because i'm super busy and it's a passion project and if i was willing to wait 20 years just to get the game it may take another 10 to make it so that's a fair warning there uh, but I'll occasionally from time to time, infrequently, but occasionally, I will give you guys some updates on where Legends of Valar is at. And uh, if we're really lucky, I'll even be able to give you eventually a launch date for the Enhanced Edition. And hopefully we'll have better time with those deadlines than the ones in the past. <laughs> all right. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks for listening. Keep the passion going. And until next time... Have a nice day.